Hello, my name is Megan. I'm a programming librarian here at the Saskatoon Public Library. We are located on Treaty 6 territory, as well as the traditional homeland of the Métis. I'd like to welcome everyone to the Sustainability Speaker Series. Presented in partnership with the Saskatchewan Environmental Society, this video was recorded on a previous date. Please enjoy. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Sustainability Speaker Series for October. Um, I'm going to start with the little commercial for the Environmental Society. Uh, the Saskatchewan Environmental Society provides community education and outreach. It undertakes research and carries out demonstration projects that move us towards sustainability. We've been working ever since 1970 on important issues such as sustainable energy and climate solutions, water protection, biodiversity preservation, and reduction of toxic substances in the environment. Now, if you're not already a member of SES, we encourage you to join. And you can find out more about our many activities and projects and how to get involved by checking out our website, which is www.environmentalsociety.ca. And if you'd like to receive email notification of future events in the Sustainability Speaker Series, uh, just send an email to the Saskatchewan Environmental Society. The email address is info at environmentalsociety.ca. Uh, and in your message, just ask to be put on the list of people to be notified of events in the Sustainability Speaker Series. So tonight, uh, we are honored to welcome Dr. Gordon Edwards as our speaker. This is, of course, one of the joys of Zoom that we can have Gordon, who's based in Montreal with us, without all the inconvenience and expense of traveling. Uh, a little bit about Gordon's background. He was a gold medal graduate in math and physics from the University of Toronto, following which he gained a master's in math and English literature at the University of Chicago, and then a PhD in math at Queen's University. In 1975, Gordon co-founded the Canadian Coalition for Nuclear Responsibility, of which he is the current president. The coalition has been for decades an easily accessible, reliable, and highly respected source of critical information about nuclear issues. From the outset, the coalition has advocated a sustainable future based on efficiency and renewable energy. In 1989, the coalition hosted the first International Green Energy Counter Conference in Montreal. Gordon is relied on as a nuclear expert by communities, by researchers, and by courts in Canada and elsewhere, and has published on radiation standards, radioactive wastes, uranium mining, nuclear weapons pro proliferation, and the economics of nuclear power. Tonight, he's going to talk to us about uranium premises, promises, and predicaments. So a very warm welcome to Saskatchewan, Gordon. And so please go ahead with your presentation. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much, Anne. It's really a pleasure. And I'm so glad that people are able to join us. I, I have, a, sli I have a, uh, a PowerPoint slideshow. And I'm going to um, 
um, just launch it and start talking. I do hope that it's not too heavy. There's a lot of material in it. I've always told that I put too much in. I'm a little too ambitious, perhaps. But uh, I will make those slides available by means of a link uh, that anybody can take a look at those slides later on and take more time going over them because I'm going to have to go a little bit more quickly through them here. Uh, so I'm just going to launch my slideshow now and uh, we'll see how that goes. Uh, oh, yes, I have to press share twice and then I have to press play from start. Here we are. Now, um, how is that? Is that okay? Can you see that all right? It is yeah. looking good. Okay, very good. Just wanted to make sure the sound and the visuals were both working. Yeah, everything's so, coming through. So I chose this title, Uranium Premises, Promises and Predicaments, and I thought, well, I better come up with some premises. <laughs> so I came up with a few premises and I wanted to, uh, uh, what do I have to do here? It's not, oh, there we go. So these are premises, these are assumptions that I think uh, many people uh, do make about uranium and about nuclear power. The first one is that uranium can be used for good or for ill. It's just a matter of choice, whether you use it for bombs, nuclear weapons, or reactors, which can produce electricity and also byproducts that can be used in medicine and industry. And the implication is that if you make that choice, then you're rejecting the alternative. So that if you choose it for peaceful purposes, you are rejecting the military use. Um, I think there's something a little bit wrong with that picture, and I'm going to be explaining it later on. Second assumption that is certainly made by people in the industry is that nuclear reactors are clean, safe, and economic, even more so now as technology advances. Uh, my feeling, on the other hand, is that these adjectives are not really accurate. And again, I'm putting up these premises, but I don't agree with them. Third one is that nuclear power is needed. This is certainly something that the Canadian government has been saying to combat climate change. Renewables are just not sufficient. And as a result, the federal government and several provinces are eager to invest in, uh, in these reactors. So I will be disputing these three premises, but I will handle them in the reverse order, starting with the number three. So number three, nuclear power is needed to combat climate change. Renewables are not sufficient. Let's take a look at this and see uh, what's behind it. The, really the real important question for us is that are our energy strategies fast enough to meet the climate emergency because as everyone knows, we're very late getting started. We should have started decades ago. And in some sense, we have started already. Uh, there have been changes made, but not nearly enough. Uh, but with regard to the nuclear aspect of it, let's consider the history of the nuclear industry worldwide. Uh, and I'm taking uh, information here from the uh, nuclear industry itself. Uh, and we see from this graph that there's been 25 years of arrested development. From 1996 to 2019, there's been virtually no change in the number of reactors. 438 reactors uh, 25 years ago and 442 reactors today. That's only a difference of four, four reactors. And as a matter of fact, since then it's gone down. So the industry has stagnated. And when you come to look at the contribution that nuclear has made to global electricity supply, it's been a very sharp decline. In 1996, it was providing 17% of global electricity. Today, it's only supplying 10%. So this is a sharp decline, and that decline is expected to continue, even by the agencies that are devoted to nuclear power. Um, I also want to mention, by the way, that electricity is only a piece of the energy pie. So that that 70% of global electricity really means less than 3.3% of global energy. And 10% of global electricity today means less than 2% of global energy. 2% with 400 and almost 450 reactors. 
you know what that means? That means that if you had another 450 reactors, it would go up to 4%. And if you added another 450 reactors, it would go up to 6%. You'd have to have 450 reactors every year for the next 50 years to get to 100%. So <laughs> that's an awfully big task. And in fact, the, the history shows that it's going the opposite way. Uh, this is not an industry that is on the expansion. It's industry that is on the decline. Um, in a similar way, uh, the industry itself, of course, recognized that it had to do something. And so around the year 2001, it promised that there would be a nuclear renaissance. That there would be hundreds of new reactors built, very large reactors, much safer, much more superior than the old reactors. Uh, and much faster to be built and deployed. And as a result of that speculate, uh, uh, as a result of that the promise of a nuclear renaissance, the price of uranium shot up very high around the years 2007 to 2009, when a, just a few reactors were ordered in this uh, nuclear renaissance. And then those prices collapsed again uh, because, in fact, it became apparent that the nuclear renaissance simply was not happening and did not happen. Uh, now, one of the units, there were only a handful of units that were ordered during this renaissance period. One of them was in Finland. It was called the Oak Kilowatto Unit 3. And uh, this, was under, this has been under construction since 2005. It's still under construction. It was originally supposed to take only four years to build, but <laughs> it's now 2022 that they're hoping that it'll start up. Uh, there's no guarantee that it will, but it's looking like it's getting finished. The estimated cost went from an original 3 billion euros, uh, which was guaranteed by the builder who was at that time Arriva, a French company. But by 2012, the price had shot up to 8.5 billion euros, and the final cost is now estimated to be closer to 11 billion euros. That's 16 billion Canadian dollars. So uh, you can see a terrific escalation of price there, three to four times more uh, in the period of time involved and much later than promised. Arriva Nuclear, in fact, went bankrupt, although it couldn't really go bankrupt because it was owned by the French government. So it was dissolved in 2016 and taken over by Electricity de France, another, another entity owned by the French government. And by the way, there is another one of these reactors under construction at Flamanville in France, and it is now five times over its original budget and with similar delays. Once again, they're looking to 2022 as a possible startup date. So these reactors, uh, even if they do come online, they have taken a lot longer and they've cost way more than what was originally anticipated. Uh, the reactor is 11 years late and, and 5.5 billion to 8 billion euros over budget. Uh, in the United States, there were four reactors ordered and two of them are in Georgia. And uh, originally the cost was estimated to be $10 billion. By That was in 2006. By 2013, the cost had escalated to $14 billion. And by 2019, 25 billion. We don't know what the final cost is going to be, but it's very high. And as a result of this, South Carolina backed out, even though they had already spent $9 billion on the project, they simply stopped the project. And there are criminal charges being laid in that case over a number of people who acted improperly, uh, allegedly acted improperly. Uh, the plants in Georgia are still nearing completion. And they are the first new reactors approved in over 30 years. So in fact, closer to 36 years. So, uh, and Westinghouse, uh, the, the, the company behind these, this design, they went bankrupt in 2017, directly related to this, uh, uh, well, what can you call it, a fiasco. Um, now here's an article that appeared just two days ago It, it crossed my, uh, came to my attention. It's from The Guardian, October 18th on Monday. Uh, it's a good article. I recommend you read it. It's, it's well-reasoned and uh, very factual. Nuclear power is too costly, too slow, so it's zero use to Australia's emissions plan. 
Uh, with a 20-year development timeline, nuclear plants won't be built soon enough to stop temperatures rising above two degrees Celsius. So why are we wasting precious time, and I might add money, debating them? Now, that's the, the, the refrain I'd like you to bear in mind. Nuclear is too costly and too slow to address the climate emergency. We have to do things now. We can't do it 10 years, 15 years from now. Now it's when it has to, we have to take the action. And nuclear is not fast on its feet. It's not light enough to react that quickly. Now here's something from the Federal uh, Energy Agency, uh, Energy Information Agency, showing a global primary energy consumption projected by energy source from 2010 to 2050. And you see that very steep green line. Renewables are much faster and much cheaper than nuclear. And that's part of the reason is because it's a proven technology. We know how to do it. And uh, uh, there's not very much guesswork anymore. And um, also, uh, it's a lot cheaper. The price has gone down and down and down, and it's continuing to go down. It's quite astonishing. Uh, so the, the, uh, the price of renewables get cheaper and cheaper every year, and the price of nuclear seems to get more and more expensive every year. Um, well, if you're a shopper, you could guess which one you might go for. Now, the, uh, I'm not sure if I can get rid of this uh, stuff at the top of my screen. I have a, a whole uh, spread of things. Can I get rid of that? Anyway, uh, the date set for a complete, oh, there we go. No, the date set for uh, a complete nuclear phase out in Germany was set before Fukushima and it was set for 2022. And we're, they're already well on course to get rid of their, all of their reactors, to shut them all down by that date. In 2011, there were only, there were eight of 17 reactors shut down overnight. And in tw by 2021, there are only six still operating in Germany. There are a total of 26 nuclear reactors being dismantled in Germany. Three have already finished. But what I'd like to call your attention to is the fact that they have built so much wind and solar in the intervening years. And in particular, um, in only eight years, in Germany built 30,000 megawatts of wind power, which happens to be almost double Canada's whole nuclear industry. If you look at all the nuclear power plants in Canada, the 22 or so in, in, uh, the, in Canada, um, it's only 15,000 megawatts. So uh, they built twice as much in only eight years. You could not build that much nuclear in only eight years. It would not be possible. Uh, by the way, this picture is a picture of an experimental breeder reactor that was built but never operated and has now been turned into an amusement park in Germany. Germany also more than doubled its offshore wind power capacity in 2014, a single year. Can you imagine any country announcing that it had doubled its nuclear capacity in only one year? Uh, it just uh, defies consideration. So this is a, an important thing to bear in mind that when you're in a crisis, if, if your house is burning down, you gotta put out the fire. You can't talk about designing a new fancy uh, sprinkler system. You have to get buckets of water and throw it on the fire and put it out. We have to work now to start arresting our greenhouse gas emissions. Nuclear is not gonna do it. Any of these new reactors that are being talked about today, none of them are gonna see the light of day until 2030 or halfway, halfway towards 2040. If ever, some of these reactors will never probably get built, never get finished. Uh, so we're gambling with the planet and this is not something we should be doing. Now in China, uh, China is often uh, talked about as uh, being a, a good customer for nuclear. They are building more nuclear power plants there for sure. In fact, they have about 50 gigawatts from 50 reactors, each reactor being a gigawatt, that's a thousand megawatts, uh, with an additional 17 gigawatts under construction. But how many people have told you that China already by 2020 had installed 281 gigawatts of wind power and 253 gigawatts of solar power, making a total of 534 gigawatts of non-hydro renewables. 
That's not even including hydro. So to meet its 2030 goals, China plans to more than double the wind and solar capacity. That brings you up to uh, over a thousand gigawatts in the coming decade. So existing renewable capacity is already over 10 times the nuclear capacity in China. And by 2030, it will likely be more than 16 times their nuclear capacity. Once again, we can see where the good money, the smart money is going. The smart money is going into renewables. They're fast, they're cheaper, they're less expensive. And once installed, they're a freebie. Now, uh, way back in 1976, Amory Levins uh, published a foreign affairs article, a very famous one, called Soft Energy Paths. And uh, there was a book that came out shortly afterwards. Uh, and he showed this uh, schematic diagram of the hard energy path from 1975 to 2025, where coal, oil and gas are phased out only by expanding both coal and nuclear. And he calls this the hard path for a pretty obvious reason. But he was advocating a different path called the soft path. And the soft path was using soft technologies um, uh, to uh, make nuclear irrelevant and to phase out oil and gas while also phasing out coal at the same time. So the soft technologies could, by 2025, uh, take over the bulk of the load. Now, of course, that all depends upon decisions that are made by governments and also by industries. But uh, in 1989, uh, we asked him to give the keynote address at the Green Energy Conference that Anne Foxworth mentioned in her opening remarks. And his, remark, his, uh, his keynote address was called the Megawatt Revolution, Solving the CO2 Problem. And he pointed out that little, that little yellow dot, you are here, was in 1989. It shows that already the curve was bending towards his view of the future rather than towards the hard energy paths that uh, government seemed to be wedded to. So um, now if we go back to uh, the, the current topic, which is these, since they can't build new reactors, they're way too expensive and nobody really wants to take a chance on them. Certainly private investors recommend not investing in these things. It's a bad investment, unless the government is willing to guarantee the debt. Of course, if they guarantee a loan, that means that it, it's, a, it's a not a risk. It's not a risk because you're guaranteed and the ultimate people who are left holding the bag are the taxpayers. So, but if we look at these small reactors, an Ontario study looked at 90 different designs of small reactors some years ago and selected nine of them as deserving of a closer look for Northern Ontario. Canadian Nuclear Laboratories in Chalk River, Ontario, looked at 80 different designs. And uh, the CNSC uh, in Ottawa, the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, has already circulated a description for a high temperature gas cooled small reactor at Chalk River. Meanwhile, New Brunswick has invested in two different small reactors, one cooled by liquid sodium, one cooled by molten salt, you know, it reminds me of uh, uh, <laughs> Leacock, uh, Stephen Leacock, who was a humorist. He wrote that a, a man flung himself on his horse and rode off madly in all directions. Um, it sounds as if you're going in all directions at once. Um, there's so many different models of small reactors and they're all competing with each other and they're all depending upon a large market share in order to make it profitable. And yet they're cutting each other's market uh, by, simply by existing. So these reactors, by the way, are all unbuilt, untested, unlicensed. They're all what, what, uh, what uh, Michael Schneider calls PowerPoint reactors. They're based on older experimental reactors that were never successfully commercialized many, many years ago, back in the 50s and 60s. For example, here we have a picture of... Uh, <laughs> the only molten salt reactors that ever operated until now were in connection with plans for a nuclear powered engine for a Cold War bomber, which canceled finally by John F. Kennedy um, uh, because of the exorbitant cost. And this project uh, with the liquid, the, uh, the molten salt reactor, the only ones that's operated up to now, as I say, uh, consumed 
almost half of the entire budget of the Oak Ridge National Laboratories. Uh, here is a, a, an experimental breeder reactor, which never was commercialized. It's EBR2 down in Idaho. It, it was a liquid sodium cooled reactor and uh, it produced uh, 20 megawatts of electricity. That's a small reactor, 20 megawatts. And it operated from 1964 to 1994. Uh, EBR1, its predecessor, had a small meltdown in 1955. So this is something that uh, has been of great interest to nuclear proponents around the world. Why don't we use liquid sodium metal as a coolant instead of water? Because the trouble with water is it boils into steam and that creates a lot of pressure and you can get a steam explosion and that can cause damage to the plant. And that's a safety problem. So uh, the nice thing about liquid sodium metal is it doesn't create pressure. And so you can operate at a much lower pressure and a much higher temperature. And this makes it more efficient in terms of converting the heat into electricity, all of which is true. But it's also true that sodium metal catches fire very fiercely on contact with water or air. And sodium fires are a uh, perpetual problem with these types of reactors. Um, here, for example, around the world, uh, they tried to build liquid sodium cooled reactors. At Fermi 1 in Detroit, there was a partial meltdown. The Super Phoenix in France had to be abandoned. The Manju breeder reactor in Japan was a kind of a fiasco that never really got off the ground. The Dunray reactor in the UK, uh, up in Scotland, was did operate for a while, but now it's defunded. None of these things were successfully commercialized. They were all efforts to build uh, liquid sodium cooled reactors. Uh, they're the only two that are now operating in the world, as far as I know, are in Russia. And uh, they too are uh, uh, maybe may become problematic. At the moment, they're working. So uh, here in Canada, we have small startup companies telling us that they can do the trick, even though the USA, France, Japan, and Britain failed to commercialize uh, sodium cooled reactors. They're going to do it in New Brunswick. Um, it just seems like a long shot. So what are the problems with promoting small modular nuclear reactors? And you'll notice, by the way, I put the N in there, which is N is for nuclear. They like to call them SMRs. They don't like to call attention to the fact that it is nuclear. Well, first and foremost, there's no independent review of these technologies. There's no environmental assessment. Even they, they even have a law, an environmental assessment law, which excludes these reactors, these small reactors from any environmental assessment. There's no public process taking place on energy policy and strategy, whether this is a wise or unwise route to go down. Why are the Canadian public, why are the Canadian politicians, why is the Canadian parliament not even being involved in any kind of uh, debate over these choices? Secondly, nuclear is, as we've said before, too slow and too costly. The new reactor designs are untested and unsure. And it creates new forms of radioactive waste, more problematic than the ones that we already have. For example, chlorine 36, which will be produced in large quantities in a molten salt reactor, has a 300,000 year half-life. And because chlorine is a very mobile chemical material, chemical element, it's going to uh, be much easier for chlorine 36 to find its way out of any repository and into the environment of living things. Uh, on the other hand, we have megawatts, which really means energy efficiency. That's the fastest, cheapest, safest bet for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, you get more bang from your buck uh, by investing in energy efficiency than anything else. Renewables are proven less and less costly and quickly deployed. And storage is definitely needed for renewables. But then again, storage is also needed for nuclear if it wants to replace petroleum, for example, in the transportation sector. The interesting thing about storage is that any storage mechanism will always advantage renewables more than nuclear because renewables are already cheaper and the only real disadvantage they have is the intermittency, which can be cured with good storage. And consequently, a storage is a plus for renewables and a minus for nuclear. So uh, concluding thoughts in this section, 
it's been shown by a friend of mine, Ralph Torrey, very good analyst, that in Quebec, converting all electrically heated buildings, which is almost all the buildings, from resistance heating to heat pumps will free up enough electricity to run a fully electrified transportation sector in this province. Uh, two, in order for an electrified transportation sector to be viable at all, great improvements will be needed in our electricity storage technology. Such improvements will advantage renewables more than nuclear. And three, already there are utility scale Tesla batteries in use by Pacific Gas and Electric. These are huge batteries that virtually eliminates the need for diesel backup generators for load following. And so um, this, it seems clear to, um, to me and to a lot of other people that renewables is the way to go. Even people in the nuclear industry pay lip service to that, to this, but they say, well, yes, but you can't leave nuclear out of the mix because there's no scenario for achieving net zero without nuclear. What they don't tell you is that they don't have a scenario for re reaching net zero with nuclear. If they had a scenario for reaching net zero with nuclear, then they might have a, a case to make. But all they're saying is that they don't see a scenario without nuclear. Well, if that's the case, then what you should do is you should say, well, nuclear cannot be totally excluded then, but we should look at what's fastest and cheapest first. Those are the things that should get the first priority. And that undoubtedly is renewables. So uh, we're making a bad mistake if we're going to uh, put our money and our political will into technologies which are untried, untested, untrue, and won't be uh, in place in time to make a significant difference. What we're doing really is kicking the can down the road and saying that we're not going to do much of anything in the short term. Now I'm going to come to the second premise that I mentioned. The second premise being that nuclear reactors are fundamentally clean, safe, and economic, and now even more so with advanced technology. Um, well, if you visit a nuclear power plant, you can't help but be impressed how clean it is. It's very, very clean, glistening. Um, and safe, uh, I think the workers will tell you that it's a safe environment to work in and that uh, um, they, uh, they feel comfortable and they get well paid and uh, they like working there. And economic, well, it's economic as long as other people pay the bills. And uh, we found, for example, in Ontario, that there was a $30 billion debt that, that drove Ontario Hydro into bankruptcy and has been only paid off that $30 billion stranded debt, which was all nuclear related. It was only paid off by monthly surcharges on everybody's hydro bill and everybody's electricity bill for many, many, many years. So when we say clean, uh, of course, there are toxic emissions and radioactive waste associated with nuclear power plants. And these things are largely invisible. Safe, well, they're safe until they're not safe. Catastrophic releases can occur. And the only thing that makes a nuclear power plant unsafe really is the radioactive waste inside the plant because that radioactive waste can get out at any time. A nuclear reactor is not just a device for generating electricity, it's also a warehouse of a vast quantity of radioactive poisons. And any warehouse can be breached. And if the warehouse is breached, the poisons are released, and then you have a serious, possibly catastrophic release. As far as economic goes, well, uh, they're not very uh, considered very economic by the insurance companies who will not cover uh, any, if you look at your own insurance policy, your homeowner's insurance policy, you'll find that there's a clause there called the nuclear exclusion clause, which simply cancels your insurance in the case of radioactive contamination from a nuclear accident. As far as investments go, Wall Street and the other large investment firms advise their customers not to invest in nuclear, and they themselves will not invest in nuclear unless they get loan guarantees from the federal government in the United States or in Canada or elsewhere. Uh, that means that risk capital without any risk. Uh, so it's really the, the public that takes the risk. And of course, we've already talked about the cost overruns, which are endemic to the industry, it seems. Now, what is radioactivity? Because that's the root of the problem. The only thing that makes nuclear technology fundamentally different from others 
is the way you boil the water and what is produced in the process. Um, it turns out that radioactivity is created inside every nuclear reactor, a huge inventory. Most atoms are stable, unchanging, eternal things. The same atom that, is there, that are in my body today may have been in the flesh of a dinosaur 100 million years ago. The same atoms, no change. But radioactive atoms are unstable. They explode or disintegrate. That's the word they prefer. When they disintegrate, they give off a kind of a subatomic shrapnel, which is very damaging to nearby living cells and even non-living materials, by the way. The half-life is the time it takes for half of these unstable atoms to explode. And if you, if you, if you, if you use one half-life to get half the atoms exploding, then it requires that same length of time for half of the remaining atoms to explode and so on and so on. A little arithmetic will show you that if you have 10 times the half-life, 10 times the half-life will reduce the amount of the number of atoms ready to explode by a factor of a thousand. But that doesn't mean they're gone. They're still there. They're just reduced by a factor of a thousand. Now, there is a small handful of naturally occurring radioactive elements. They call it natural radioactivity. But there are many hundreds of completely human-made radioactive elements that are not found in nature prior to 1939 when nuclear fission was discovered. So what is radioactivity? Well, a radioactive atom has a nucleus, a core, which is unstable. And when that nucleus disintegrates, it gives off one or two very, very fast-moving projectiles, extremely energetic, and it's called atomic radiation. There are two types of particles. There's an alpha particle and a beta particle, which are much less penetrating than the gamma rays, which are like X-rays, but even more powerful than X-rays. So you can either have a gamma ray or an alpha particle, which is not very penetrating, won't even go through a piece of paper, or a beta particle, which is more penetrating, but not nearly as much as an X-ray. It'll only go a certain distance into soft tissue. Um, strangely enough though, these non-penetrating, relatively non-penetrating particles, the alpha and beta, are far more damaging than the gamma rays, which go right through you. Part of the reason for that is that the gamma rays do go right through you. The particles, they deliver all their energy to your living cells, and they do far more damage. And the result is that the alpha-emitting radioactive materials are harmless outside the body, but they're very, very dangerous and deadly inside the body. In fact, one plutonium disintegration, for example, which is an alpha emission, is approximately 18,000 times more biologically damaging than the same uh, disintegration of a tritium atom. Tritium is radioactive as well. A factor of 18,000 times in terms of biological damage, and yet they're both giving off just one projectile. So uh, the three types of projectiles are alpha, beta, and gamma. And uh, the, the, uh, we need not say any more about that. We'll just go to the next one. A gamma ray is like an X-ray, but more powerful. Beta particles like a subatomic bullet. It's moderately penetrating, harder to detect. An alpha particle is like a subatomic cannonball. It's very slightly penetrating, but highly damaging. And so alpha and beta emitters are primarily internal hazards, whereas gamma emitters are both internal and external hazards. Now, uh, all of this was discovered way back in 1896 by Henri Becquerel, who is accidentally discovered that uranium ore is radioactive. Uranium had been discovered a couple of hundred years earlier uh, and was named after the planet Uranus, which had been discovered around that time. But, uh, but it's Becquerel who discovered that it's radioactive. It was giving off some kind of invisible light, which he couldn't see, but which his photographic plates detected and showed tracks from the radioactive emissions from the uranium ore. This is a uranium, a piece of uranium ore in a cloud chamber, and you can see the tracks of all three types of emissions, the alpha, beta, and gamma emission from a chunk of uranium ore. You wouldn't be able to see this, of course, without the cloud chamber. Uh, Marie Curie, uh, two years later, she discovered that there are other radioactive materials in the uranium ore that are even more radioactive than uranium. They give off more powerful uh, rays. And she named two of them, radium and polonium. 
And a student of hers discovered that radium, which is a metal, a, a radioactive heavy metal, gives off spontaneously a, a gas, a radioactive gas called radon. And we now know that these substances, radium, polonium, and radon, are extremely hazardous materials that can, that can cause deadly damage to uh, large numbers of people in very small quantities because of the, uh, the fact that these, uh, these emissions from the disintegrating atoms damage the cells in such a way that the cells can then go on to multiply and multiply the damage. And so many years later, you see cancers and other defects that were caused by uh, the initial damage that might've been done to just a few cells. Uh, in fact, girls who are hired, young girls, these are girls who are generally in their, still teenagers, they're, they're 17, 16, 15, some of them. Um, they were hired to use radioactive paint, uh, radium-based paint, to make the numerals on watch tiles glow in the dark. And they ingested minute amounts of radium when they licked the tips of their brushes to get a very fine point. And there were many deaths. Thousands died from fatal anemia, from bone cancer, and later on from head cancers caused by ingestion of such small quantities of radium-226 that it would not have been able to be detected by the chemical methods of the time. Um, now, all these uh, byproducts of uranium, it turns out that they are so-called disintegration byproducts of uranium. Every single atom of radon gas, every single atom of radium, every single atom of polonium began as an atom of uranium. Because when uranium disintegrates, it doesn't disappear, it transforms into one of these materials. And so you have a whole, what's called a decay chain, and all of these very dangerous materials are not wanted by the nuclear reactors. And so uh, they are thrown away in the waste. This is a 10 meter high wall, which contains 70 million tons of uranium tailings behind that wall. And that contains all of the, uh, the, the radium, the radon emissions and the polonium that was in the original ore from which we extracted the uranium. That's also true in Northern Saskatchewan. You have large amounts of these uranium residues. Now, uh, what happens with uranium, for example, if you look at this rather intimidating chart, is that uranium-238 undergoes changes. It changes into a thorium atom, and then into a protactinium, and then into another uranium, and then into another thorium, and then into radium, and then into radon. It's called a decay chain. And there's about a dozen different byproducts of uranium there. And because the companies only want the uranium, they leave all the rest in the tailings. So 85% of the radioactivity is left behind in the tailings. When you take away the uranium from the top, what you're left with is the longest lived material that's left over in the tailings is thorium-230 with a half-life of 76,000 years. Now that thorium-230 now becomes the grandfather of all those other things. So it's producing the radium, the radon, the polonium. You don't need the uranium anymore. You got the thorium-230 to do the job. And that means that these materials will not diminish by half for 76,000 years. It'll take 76,000 years for the radium to diminish by half. And the same thing goes for all the other things. Why? Because they're continually replenished by the disintegrating thorium atoms. So this becomes a very, very long lived. I mean, 76,000 years dwarfs the span of human history. The pyramids of Egypt are only 5,000 years old. So these toxic materials, highly toxic materials, are right on the surface in a, in a finely ground condition. Now, uh, the uranium mill, the, the problems are primarily not just from gamma radiation for being on the tailings and near the tailings, but also the dust blowing, the dust blowing spreads radium and arsenic, and, and there's also non-radioactive non poisons as well. A lot of arsenic in the Saskatchewan tailings, for example. And that dust blowing spreads the source of uh, other radioactive byproducts. So um, uh, gradually over the years with erosion, the source of radioactivity gets spread out, and therefore the result of uh, radon gas given off can increase by a factor of tens of thousands 
just by spreading out the, uh, the sand over a larger area. Um, you also have radon gas being given off. And as I say, that will spread as the dust spreads. And you also have seepage into the groundwater uh, and uranium and arsenic are the two main concerns there. So it's a big problem. These tailings are going to be a, uh, uh, an environmental hazard for thousands and thousands and thousands of years to come. And of course, with erosion and the forces of nature, um, the chances that they will stay intact and stay in a tight formation as they are right now is less and less likely as time goes on. So concluding thoughts, Canada has accumulated over 250 million tons of these radioactive uranium mill tailings. These voluminous sand-like radioactive waste will remain a formidable environmental threat for hundreds of thousands of years to come. And according to the US Geological Survey, after about a thousand years, the toxicity of these uranium tailings is on a par with the toxicity of radiated nuclear fuel, the so-called high-level radioactive waste. Now, I, I should clarify that that's per unit of energy produced. So if you look at, for example, uh, a year's worth of energy produced by a nuclear reactor, there would be so much irradiated fuel from that, and there would also be so much uranium going into that. So what they're doing is they're comparing it per unit of energy, per unit of energy produced by the reactors. The toxicity of the tailings is approximately the same as the toxicity of irradiated nuclear fuel after the first thousand years. So what is nuclear energy really? Why do we call it nuclear energy? Well, every atom has a tiny core called the nucleus. And nuclear energy is energy that comes directly from the nucleus. Uh, the nucleus is surrounded by one or two more orbiting electrons. The force that holds the nucleus together happens to be the strongest force in the universe. And you can see this in nuclear weapons, the H-bomb blast here. By the way, I think this is the Ivy Mike explosion which was approximately 700 times more powerful, more destructive than the Hiroshima bomb. And it uses both fission and fusion, but it depends very uh, fundamentally on uranium. Without uranium, such a bomb would be impossible. So radioactivity is also a form of nuclear energy. Radioactivity is a form of nuclear energy that cannot be shut off. There's no way to shut it off. It just keeps emitting and emitting and emitting and emitting. Uh, and you can shield it. You can put it in a container. You can move it from place to place, but you can't stop it. That's why we have a nuclear waste problem that doesn't go away. Now, here we have a model of the uranium atom, which is the key element in all fission technology, both military and civilian, because uranium is the only material that occurs in nature that you can use to get what's called a chain reaction going. And a chain reaction is what you need for either a bomb or a nuclear reactor. There's no other material in nature that will do this. This is a monument to the splitting of the atom. It's a Russian monument uh, near, near the town of uh, Chelyabinsk. Uh, when the uranium nucleus is split, enormous energy is released. That's that force that binds the nucleus together that is released. The fragments are highly, the fragments, by the way, are those, semi, those hemispheres. You see those two hemispheres there. Those represent the highly radioactive new elements that are called fission products, which are, in essence, the broken bits of uranium atoms. The semicircles in the sculpture simply indicate the energy that is released. Now, here is a, here is a model, a replica of the uranium bomb that exploded at Hiroshima. It was called Little Boy. It was made from highly enriched uranium. Um, and uh, some of that uranium uh, probably came from Canada, uh, either directly from uh, uh, the mine in, in Port Radium up in the Northwest Territories, or indirectly from the Congo with ore that was processed at Port Hope, Ontario. And this was called Little Boy, and it was highly enriched uranium. This is the result. The structure of the city of Hiroshima caused by Little Boy on August 6th. Um, as I mentioned, that H-bomb I showed earlier is about 700 times more destructive than this, if you can imagine such a thing. 
Now, here's what a chain reaction is. When a neutron strikes a fissile uranium atom, and a fissile uranium atom is called uranium-235, it's got 235, 235 chunks uh, of particles in the, in the, in the nucleus. Um, that uranium atom will split, and the results are those fission products we already talked about, and a lot of energy, and also more neutrons, and that's the key, the more neutrons is the key, because these extra neutrons can go on to trigger more fissions, and that will go on to create also more radioactive materials by a process called activation. So the extra neutrons are necessary to multiply the energy, and they also actually increase the inventory of radioactive garbage. Now here's a point the pro can do nuclear reactor. It uses natural uranium, that's unenriched uranium. We don't need to enrich uranium for use in a can do reactor because we've, uh, we're using a very unusual material, not radioactive, called heavy water. Heavy water is not radioactive, it's just heavier than normal water. And for technical reasons, it allows us to use natural uranium and still get a chain reaction. In the United States, they don't use heavy water and so they have to enrich their uranium. I'll explain what enrichment is a little later. So here's the inside of a CANDU reactor. The core of the reactor is where the uranium is. That's where the uranium atoms are split. And the energy from that is used to boil, to heat water to very high temperature. That water is pumped to devices called boilers or steam generators. And ordinary light water, not heavy water, is allowed to boil and produce steam. And that steam is then used to generate electricity. So basically, it's just another way of boiling water, but there's an awful lot of energy there. And so everything in the red primary cooling circuit becomes radioactive, even though the radioactivity originates from the core of the reactor where the uranium atoms are being split. Nevertheless, it's carried by the water throughout the reactor system. So you get a lot of radioactivity all the way around. <coughs> Now, a can-do fuel bundle like one of these can be handled safely before it's used, but after it's used in a reactor, it'll deliver a lethal radiation dose in a few seconds. This man is an actor. It's in a Canadian Nuclear Association ad. It's called Small Wonder. And he's basically saying, look at this tiny uranium fuel pellet. Um, that fuel pellet made of uranium has enough energy as a carload of coal. Isn't that amazing? The concentration of energy. And you can get that energy out without releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So you have a double benefit. You've got the concentration of energy and the fact that it's not carbon emitting when it's used to produce energy in the reactor. But what he doesn't tell you and what the ad doesn't tell you is that once that fuel pellet has been used to produce energy, you cannot throw it away. You have to keep your eye on it for the next 10 million years or so. And the reason why is because that fuel pellet is no longer just uranium. It is now high level radioactive waste containing all those fission products. And there's hundreds of them. All those fission products are contained in there. And this man would be dead as a doornail if one of those reactors, if one of those fuel bundles had already come out of the reactor after being used. It would kill a human being in 20 seconds. Here's a man standing in front of the core of a CANDU reactor, but it has never been used, this reactor. And as a result, it's safe for him to stand there. If he stood there after the reactor had operated for a period of time, he would be killed very quickly because of the blast of gamma radiation coming off, not from the uranium, but from the fission products. And as a matter of fact, the fission products that are produced are so radioactive that they continue to generate heat. Uh, so much so that if you don't actually remove the heat from the core of the reactor, even when the reactor shut down, the reactor will melt down because of the radioactivity of the fission products. That will heat up the core to the melting point of uranium oxide, which is already about twice the melting point of steel and everything inside the reactor will melt like butter. And that's what you have when you have a, a fuel meltdown. At Fukushima, they had three fuel meltdowns. All three of those reactors were shut down. The problem was they didn't have any cooling water to remove the radioactively generated heat. And that's what led to the meltdown. Now, 
here in Canada, we put our spent fuel, our irradiated fuel, underwater for at least 10 years. And that water is circulating to cool the fuel, which means to remove the heat so that the temperature doesn't rise to the point where the water would boil off and radioactive, the heat, the, the fuel would then damage itself by overheating and will release radioactive vapors and gases into the atmosphere in large amounts. Um, so the categories of radioactive waste materials inside the irradiated fuel are the fission products, which are not found in nature, most of them prior to 1939. There are also things called activation products, which are also not found in nature prior to 1939 for the most part. And these are activated by absorbing strain neutrons. What this refers to is the fact that the actual steel and concrete and structural materials themselves become radioactive because of neutrons getting absorbed and destabilizing the atoms and turning them into radioactive atoms when before they were not radioactive. And there's also something called transuranics. These are heavier than uranium. Plutonium and americium are examples of that. These heavier than uranium elements happen because some types of uranium atoms do not split when they absorb a neutron. They just become heavier. And when they become heavier, they actually change into another radioactive material. And that's called a transuranic actinide. So here's a list of 211 radioactive materials that are created inside every nuclear reactor. These are found in 10 year old can do fuel. There's lots more that aren't listed here because they will have already disappeared in the first 10 years. Some of them have half-lives that are only a fraction of a second and they're gone in the wink of an eye. Others last for thousands or even millions of years. And this list is by no means complete. It's just a list of, of the ones that they, that they know well about. Uh, now, uh, the longevity of the radioactive waste, the reason the radioactive waste is so long lived is that the bulk of that future radiation dose risk comes from the long lived fission products, like, and I have some listed here. They have half lives in the hundreds of thousands or millions of years. And these materials, some of them, because of their chemistry, they're much easier to escape into the environment and they're much easier to get into living things and consequently do damage. So they are the ones that uh, have to be looked at very carefully when planning any kind of long lived uh, containment repository. And now plutonium itself is extremely toxic as well as being dangerous from the point of view of, uh, of uh, bomb making. Um, if we look at the fuel from uh, Kandu reactors today, they contain about 200 tons of plutonium in the existing Kandu spent fuel. That would give 285 trillion overdoses. That means you could, you'd have enough material there to overdose 285 trillion human beings. Of course, we don't have that many human beings. But after 240,000 years, we'll be able to overdose 285 billion human beings. That's the factor of a, a, a thousand that I was telling you about. And then if you wait another 10 half-lives, it goes down to 285 million and then down to 285,000. And after 960,000 years, there would only be enough plutonium to overdose about 286 workers. So that's the way radiation works. Just because you have 10 half-lives and it's reduced by a thousand doesn't mean it's harmless. It just means that it's a thousand times less harmful than it was before. Now, in addition to the radioactive contamination, whereby materials are carried by the water through the pipes, there's also this activation. Activation is when a neutron hits a non-radioactive substance like cobalt-59 and turns it into highly radioactive cobalt-60. That happens in the steel. And so the steel becomes intensely radioactive and cannot be handled except by robots because uh, the cobalt-60 makes it far too radioactive to handle. And that's only one of many activation products. Here's some of the activation products which have very long half-lives. Nickel 59, Nickel 63, Niobium 94, Technetium 99, Iodine 129. These things have half-lives of millions or th hundreds of thousands of years. We come to the very last premise that I put down first. Uh, 
And that is that uranium can be used for good or for ill. The choice is ours, bombs or electricity. And the implication is often made that if you choose to use uranium for peaceful purposes, then you're safe because it's not going to be used for military purposes. Uh, I wish it were true. It's not true. The reason why is because you can use it for peaceful purposes, and then you can turn around and use the same leftovers for military purposes, for nuclear weapons. Now, the key to making nuclear weapons is, first of all, uranium enrichment. You've got to enrich uranium to over 20% of uranium-235 before it's weapons usable. Natural uranium only has 0.7% uranium-235. It cannot be used for weapons as it is, unless it's enriched. And enriching means bringing up that concentration of U-235. And you might think that's an easy matter. It's not. It's very difficult because uranium-235 is exactly the same as uranium-238 in every respect, except for the fact that it's a little bit lighter. Now, plutonium production is, is the real problem here because all power reactors create plutonium as a byproduct. Some of those uranium atoms in the reactor absorb neutrons and are transformed into plutonium. And plutonium is the raw material for most of the nuclear weapons in the world today. And it's called the trigger for the H-bombs. Without the plutonium trigger, you don't have a bomb. So the predicament is plutonium cannot be denatured. Any form of plutonium created inside any kind of reactor is usable for weapons. It does not have to be enriched. It can just be extracted chemically, and then it can be used for bombs. Now, the first two bombs that were used on Japan in 1945 were Little Boy, the Hiroshima bomb, which was made from highly enriched uranium. And the other one was called Fat Man, the Nagasaki bomb, which was made from plutonium. And that plutonium is really, every atom of plutonium started off as an atom of uranium because plutonium doesn't exist in nature except insofar as it is created by bombarding uranium with neutrons. This glass ball, which is used as a paperweight by the man holding it, is exactly the same size as the ball of plutonium in the bomb that destroyed the city of Nagasaki. It weighs about 6.2 kilograms. It's about the size of a large orange or a very small grapefruit. Uh, that's all you need to destroy a city. And uh, when you look at it that way, you realize what a dangerous material this is. Also, the, the half-life of plutonium is 24,000 years, which means you're going to have to wait 24,000 years before half of that stuff has disintegrated and leaving you only half of a glass ball. But you still have enough if you have, uh, if you have uh, tons of the material to begin with. You've still got lots of bombs that you can make with what's left over. So if we look at the present inventory of can-do used fuel, right now we have 200 tons, which would be good for 32,000 bombs. After 24,000 years, we had half as much, 16,000 bombs. After 48,000 years, we have 8,000 bombs. Now here's the question. Even if we are scrupulously careful not to use uranium for military purposes, we are still creating plutonium, which is going to be around for hundreds of thousands of years after we're gone. And any regime in the future, any terrorist or criminal who can dig up that plutonium can use it to make nuclear weapons. So we have created a permanent problem. And uh, the question is, should we keep on doing it? Because all reactors do this. All the reactors, no matter how large or how small they are, they all produce high-level radioactive waste. They all produce plutonium. So we are continuing to increase the inventory of these things. Uh, whether the reactors are small or large makes no difference, except that the government and the companies don't mention the waste problem. They do not mention the radioactive waste. They do not say what they're going to do with it. They do not say how they're going to dismantle the radioactive structure and where they're going to put the radioactive rubble from those structures when they talk about small modular reactors. So you're not being told the whole truth, and that is a problem. Now, uh, every H-bomb, as I said, requires plutonium. Plutonium is a trigger. It's at the top of the H-bomb here. This is a model of the H-bomb held by a man named Howard Moreland, who wrote an article called How to Make an H-bomb. 
And uh, he was arrested and his uh, magazine uh, uh, plates were confiscated as uh, high security documents until he was able to demonstrate that he got all his information from the America, the uh, Americana Encyclopedia in an article written by Edward Keller, the father of the H-bomb. And consequently, the judge ruled that this information was not uh, uh, breaking security. It was already public information. And in fact, it was more dangerous to try and pretend that it was secret because Howard Moreland made the case. The only secret really about the H-bomb is that there is no secret. Now here's how plutonium is created in a nuclear reactor. When an atom of uranium-238 absorbs a neutron, it turns into plutonium. And that plutonium, as I said, can be used for nuclear weapons now or thousands of years from now. Now here's a problem, is that there is at the moment what I call a radioactive firewall between the used nuclear fuel and bombs. Why can't anybody just take the used fuel bundles from a CANDU reactor and get the plutonium and use it to make a bomb? Why can't they do that? Well, the reason is because the uranium fuel bundle, after it's used, will kill any human being that comes close to it. So this is what I mean by a radioactive firewall. You can't handle it except by heavy shielding and robotic equipment. Um, and that acts as a kind of a prevention. It means that you can't just easily turn uh, the stuff from a nuclear reactor into nuclear bombs. But there's a, something called reprocessing. Reprocessing is a technology whereby you take the spent fuel bundles and you dissolve them and put them into a liquid form uh, by dissolving them either in acid or in molten salt. And then you separate the plutonium from the other chemicals. And once that plutonium has been separated, then it can be used as fuel for a nuclear reactor. And that's what they're planning to do in New Brunswick. One of the small reactors they want to build in New Brunswick is called the Moltex Molten Salt Reactor. And they want to start off by reprocessing the can-do spent fuel that we already have there and uh, get the plutonium out and use that as fuel for their own small modular reactor. The only problem is that once you separate the plutonium, then you can either take it out the front door as reactor fuel, or you can take it out the back door and use it for bombs. So you are creating a very dangerous situation. You have eliminated the firewall and you have made plutonium much more accessible. Now you might say, well, New Brunswick is not gonna make nuclear bombs, surely. No, but they're talking about exporting these reactors around the world. They want to build these small modular reactors so they can mass produce them and sell them everywhere. So if they're all going to be doing the same thing, then that means we're going to have people all over the world separating plutonium and uh, having the option of using that plutonium for bombs. So this is a very dangerous development. And yet there's no public debate whatsoever. There's no public debate about any aspect of these small modular reactor plans. It's all being done behind closed doors. And the politicians are hearing only from the nuclear salesmen. They're not hearing any other point of view. They're not entertaining any other point of view. Now, uh, the other way to make weapons is to make highly enriched uranium. And uh, here we have a chart that kind of tries to illustrate this. In natural uranium, you only have 0.7% uranium-235. So the left, the square at the left indicates that there's a very tiny amount of red stuff, the red stuff indicating uranium-235. In the United States, they have to enrich it a little bit. They get it up to around three to 5% uranium-235, but that's still less than 20% uranium-235. And you can't make a bomb with that either. It's only when you get up to the third square where you have 20% uranium-235, it's now possible to use this for weapons, although not easy and cumbersome, and it would be awfully bulky, uh, but you can do it. Uh, what they prefer to do is go all the way to 90% uranium-235. In that case, they have uh, weapons-grade uranium. That's what the Hiroshima bomb was made from. Well, the point is that if you do a little arithmetic, you'll see that if you wanna make weapons-grade uranium, 84% of the work has already been done by the time you get to 20%. And here's the kicker. 
the new small modular reactors that are being promoted in Canada, many of them want to use 20% or very close to 20% enriched uranium. That means they're making it through the use of plutonium, through the use of unusually highly enriched uranium, although not, not strictly speaking beyond the threshold, they're making the world a far more dangerous place in terms of the proliferation of nuclear weapons. They're making it easier for those who do want to make bombs to get their hands on the material to do it with. And this is something that all Canadians should be deeply concerned about. And for those of you in Saskatchewan, who are um, one of the world's largest storehouses of natural uranium, you should be concerned about where that uranium is going to end up and uh, what, it might, what the ultimate fate might be. These young Kazakh women, this is a photo by my good friend, Robert Del Tredici, who made most of the black and white photographs in this show. They have just learned that high level liquid radioactive waste was dumped into the Tetra River that flows past their village decades ago, which explains a rash of diseases that took place since in, in many villages down, downstream from where they are. High level radioactive liquid waste results from the reprocessing of radiated nuclear fuel in order to recover the plutonium for use either as an explosive or as a fuel. And so these women are now facing the reality which nobody ever told them before that for decades, their villages have been exposed to this, this very hazardous material in their environment without anybody that the doctors were forbidden to use the word radioactivity or the word radiation. They instead said that they, people were dying and getting sick from what they called a vegetative syndrome. Concluding remarks, Canada has never enriched uranium. Our reactors use only natural unenriched uranium, which cannot be used as a nuclear explosive. Why should we want to change that? Secondly, in the past, Canada produced and sold plutonium from Chalk River for use in US nuclear weapons, as well as a great deal of uranium for use by the US military during the Cold War, but no more. In 1965, Canada's policy changed and said, we will not sell nuclear materials for weapon purposes. Uh, do we want to compromise our, our uh, position on this? Thirdly, since several, small modular reactor designs require the use of enrichment and reprocessing facilities to extract plutonium. Should Canadians demand a thorough public review of the entire scenario? That's the end of my talk. I want to thank everybody for paying attention and I uh, hope it wasn't too much, cramming too much into a small space of time. Thank you, bye-bye. <laughs>